Community-centered, community-supported. Alaska Public Media. Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. The K-300 sled dog race in the Bethel region last weekend tested racers with frigid winds and deep cold. Pete Kaiser met the challenge to win his eighth victory and is already focused on future runs. Obviously we have to come back next year with a lot of good training and a, a good dog team and that's not easy. So every, every one of these victories that I've had I'm very thankful for knowing you know it could be the last, you never know. What might sled dog racing in Alaska look like in the next year and in future decades? We'll talk with racers about how they're planning and what they expect right now on Alaska Insight. Good evening. The Iditarod and the Yukon Quest may be the first races to come to mind when thinking about sled dog racing for many Alaskans, but mid-distance races like the K300 in Bethel and the Cobra 440 in Kotzebue are gaining in popularity as well. This evening, we'll discuss the future of mushing as a sport. But first, here are some of the top stories of the week from Alaska Public Media's collaborative statewide news network. Governor Mike Dunleavy implored Alaskans and lawmakers to capitalize on the state's natural resources, touting it as the main path forward for Alaska's economic future during his annual State of the State address on Tuesday. Much of the speech, however, focused on education, a topic that has already dominated the early days of this year's legislative session. During the speech, Dunleavy argued for shifting the focus away from an increase to the state's per-student education funding formula, while also highlighting other education-related changes the legislature is considering. The governor told reporters last week he would veto any bill that solely raises the funding formula known as the BSA without any other education items included in it, such as his proposal to give bonuses to teachers that complete a year in the state. More than 10,000 soldiers will converge on the Donnelly Training Area near Fort Greeley next week in preparation for this year's Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center exercise, the largest military training exercise of its kind. From February 8th through the 22nd, most of the 11th Airborne Division, along with U.S. Marines, Alaska Nas Army National Guard, and Canadian military troops will take part in the training exercise meant to increase the readiness of the United States Arctic Fighting Forces. Many of the troops will be arriving by airplane or helicopter, but a spokesperson for the division noted there will still be a number of vehicles coming up the park's highway toward Donnelly. Diamond High School STEM teacher Kat Walker has been named one of four finalists for the National Teacher of the Year Award given out by the Council of Chief State School Officers. Walker was named Alaska Teacher of the Year last spring during a surprise assembly. Walker currently teaches marine biology, oceanography, and vocational education courses with lesson plans that often connect students with businesses in the community. The winner of the national contest will be announced in April. You can find the full versions of these and many more stories on our website, alaskapublic.org, or by downloading the Alaska Public Media app on your phone. Now, a topic that many Alaskans enjoy, certainly myself, sled dog racing and the future of this iconic Alaska sport. Last weekend, the Kuskokwim 300 race in Bethel challenged drivers with brutal cold and icy conditions. Some mushers withdrew before the start because of the extreme cold. Reporter Ben Matheson has this K300 race recap. <laughs> January 26th marked the start of the 45th annual Kuskokwim 300 sled dog race. After a January thaw, the Kuskokwim went into a deep freeze just in time to set up a sled dog superhighway. Before the race even began, several mushers withdrew, fearing the toll that the cold, hard trail could take on their teams. With temperatures at 15 degrees below and wind chills threatening to plunge down to negative 65, 
Alaska's fastest sled dog teams came to Bethel to test their luck on a rock-hard, icy trail. This year's contending teams found themselves in elite company. Defending K300 champion Pete Kaiser took off from Bethel vying for his eighth victory, but to win, his team had to outrun three previous K300 champs. Matt Fehler, who narrowly beat Kaiser in 2019, 2021 champion Richie Deal of Antioch, and Willow's Ramey Smith, who won the race in 1995. Also in the mix, reigning Iditarod champion and mushing royalty Ryan Reddington and rookie Raymond Alexi. The rookie from Queethlook has had a hot winning streak coming into this weekend. He's won all 10 races he's entered over the past two years. As 23 teams raced into the frigid night, mushers kept the pace flaming hot. First time K300 competitor Ryan Reddington was the first musher to make it to Tulixac, completing the first leg of the race in just under four hours. For the first 100 miles, it looked like it could be anyone's race as the teams began to space out their mandatory six hours of rest between checkpoints. Queethlook musher Jason Pavla appeared to be saving up most of his rest for the latter part of the race. Pavla was the first musher into the halfway checkpoint of Antioch. After the stop in Antioch, teams braved the tussocks and frozen lakes of the Whitefish Lake Loop before returning to Kalskag. By the time the front of the race pack reached Kalskag, a clearer picture of the race had come into view. Defending champion Pete Kaiser finished the run from Antioch to Kalskag with the fastest time and was the first to leave. But just behind him was Matt Failer chasing his second title after coming in second place to Kaiser the past two years. Kaiser left the Kalskag checkpoint Saturday evening, just two minutes in front of 2019 winner Matt Failer. But by the time Kaiser reached Tuluksak, he had widened his lead to 37 minutes. After completing the mandatory four hours of rest at Tuluksak, Kaiser took off towards Bethel in pursuit of the win. Sunday morning, Kaiser cruised through the race route with all 12 dogs at 925, securing his eighth K300 title. You know, I don't think we're one of the fastest teams out there as far as raw foot speed goes, but we're real consistent and we try to we try to put to string together, you know, consistent runs from the, from start all the way to finish. Kaiser is the second winningest musher in K300 history. If he were to win another title, he would tie Jeff King's all-time record of nine. You know, I think the goal would just be to win another one, but it happens to be, it would happen to be, uh, you know, the ninth one that would tie Jeff. So that's kind of cool. But um, obviously, we have to come back next year with a lot of good training and a, a good dog team and put it all together and see if we could do it again. And that's not easy. So every every one of these victories that I've had, I'm very thankful for, knowing you know it could be the last. You never know. Matt Failer finished in second place. He said that Pete's mastery of the Cusco terrain makes him almost impossible to pass when Team Kaiser is on the game. I just know how to get second place. <laughs> We've got five solid dogs right here that could win. It's just a matter of getting a few more litters and keeping it going. You know, it's it's a it's not a job. It's it's a it's a farm. It's a lifestyle. It's a career. So, no, uh, yeah, all the credit to Pete. He deserves another championship because he is the best. Joining me tonight are two people who know the world of sled dog racing well. Janet Clark is a former racer herself and is the race marshal for the annual Fur Rendezvous Open World Championship Sled Dog Race. Janet is also a board member of the Alaskan Sled Dog and Racing Association. And Mark Nordman is also with us. Mark is, is the Iditarod Race Director. Welcome both of you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for being here in person, Mark. So nice to have you here. And I should note that veterinarian and musher Jesse Klecka was planning to join us, but Alaska Weather had other plans and she was delayed returning from the Kuskokwim 300. So Mark, starting with you, the Iditarod racers often encounter deep cold. Racers, as we saw in the K300, experienced extreme cold and icy conditions, high, you know, just extreme wind chill. As a race director, what goes into deciding to race in those conditions and what do vets watch for in dogs to know if they're doing okay or if they're in trouble? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It was on a short notice. I'm sorry that Jessica couldn't be here. She would have been a great addition to your show. You know, I just, I just came back from Bethel and I was actually able to go up to Kalskag once again, rode up with Andy Anksman, their race marshal. I learned every time I go to an event, I learned from, from that event itself. And of course, I spent the weekend with Will Peterson who most of your people will know here for sure. Um, why do you go to Bethel? You know, we always say if you want to have a really good placing, if not um, win the Iditarod, 
go to the K300 because all those conditions are there. It can be warm. We can have the Kuskokwim. We can have the cold weather they had here. Really demanding race this year. All about team management. Great veterinary corps. That Delta is such a hotbed of mushing that everybody is learning from the K300. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I and other racers go there to learn and then put it into the Yukon Quest. You know, every race has a reason that they should be very proud of themselves. And there's nobody that's doing a better job than the folks on the, on the Delta there. So, you know, veterinary-wise, if Jessica here, she would speak on it, but just team management, just taking care of them, realizing the Iditarod is three Cuscos back-to-back. -back. So not at the speeds, of course, that they go, but it, it was a great event, and they really have it together, and veterinary care was great up there this year. And what do vets look for? Is it mainly worries over frostbite and feet, or is it lung damage from running when you're exerting, you know, yeah. breathing hard in, in very frigid it's, conditions? It's definitely not lung damage. Okay. It's amazing. I've been very fortunate with my partner, Denise Albert, up in Denali to do some studies for National Institute of, Institute of Health. Why are these dogs not freezing their lungs? Why are they not developing this cold weather induced asthma um, that some of our supreme winter athletes are. It's, um, it's more the little dings, muscle pulls mm. and going too fast on a, you know, a glare ice, trying to get them. Do you wear booties when it's super, super icy? Maybe you want to take them off. It's all that management. All the dogs looked really good at the starting line when they came into Bethel. And Pete it finished with all of his dogs. And, and there's a perfect example. You know, yeah. Pete is kind of the the leader of the pack right now up there. Richie Deal, of course, has been up front. Matthew Failer has won the race. Uh, we have a bunch of new people that came on board. Hunter Keefe did very well, and I did a rod all the way down the line. And, and I keep going back to what they've done in Bethel. All those d local teams, what Myron Anksman and Paul and the race manager Paul and the whole crew, what they've been able to do, they're teaching dog care throughout their whole event and their whole region. That's it's been really fun to see. Fantastic. Janet, I want to get you in here now. Your thoughts about the wind chill during the K300. It was expected to be 65 below. Have you raced or trained in similar conditions in the past? I have to say thank you also, Lori, and so fun to listen to you, Mark, as usual. Um, the things that are that Mark described in the distance races are very, very I, I, it could have been you know, and Pete and uh, on the on the uh, video footage that you had there, that could have been one of our sprint races as well in terms of all of the same concerns, the concerns about the little things that Mark described to you, that aspect of the athlete, the athletic dog running at speed, which is what sprint racers do, running at speed and and cracking a little bit or cutting a little bit of a foot, the same thing that happens in human athletes too, but over the distance and at the speeds that our dogs go, that becomes actually a injury that can't be, that can't be solved very quickly or, or, um, or, or completely. And I, and I feel like all of those same concerns happen in the cold weather, like we just experienced this last weekend. We held races on Saturday and Sunday of the weekend that we just uh, finished. And it was negative 22 to begin with. There was a little breeze going and it was hard to race in those situations. But like always in a sprint race, those dogs got to get back to their trucks and be put into their warm and cozy um, uh, dog truck. And they got to get their feet all sabbed off and they were able to recover that rather quickly. The distance drivers with their day after day kind of concerns are they have another level of dog care that has to happen differently than what our champion dog mushers have to do in the uh, in the open races and in the limited races as well all of those require sled dog drivers that are cognizant about veterinary care and about just dog maintenance in general it was a first time in a long time this weekend that i have seen many of those sprint drivers putting on coats on their dogs to protect the areas that are a bit um, susceptible to frost nipping. Mm -hmm. And there were several teams that went ahead and bootied all up. They just, it's too early in the season to have foot problems. And mm -hmm. so all of those are stemming from an intense effort to maximize 
your dog's performance by taking outstanding care of them. That really makes sense, especially early in the season. You want to make sure that your dog can hang in there and, and have healthy feet and uh, good muscles throughout the race. Mark, how is this year's Iditarod shaping up? It, it's actually shaping up really well. You know, we had a smaller field last year. We're up to 43 right now, mm -hmm. which is for me is dealing with a lot of logistics with other people that I work with. Um, it's nice not to have, you know, one year, not too many years ago, we had 96 leave the starting line. That's a, that's a really tough thing to deal with. Lots of snow. You know, there's all kinds of different issues we deal with. I've got three trail breakers, four trail breakers up right now trying to put the trail in between Finger Lake and Rainy Pass. Our other event, of course, in the state is the world famous Iron Dog. They're going a little bit different route. We have Beetle Kill, you know, we're always talking about climate change and what we're having to deal with and that we could do a whole other segment on what we're facing with the changes we've had in our climate. Um, the village relations is going well. Um, I may at this point, I think I have a new race marshal. This will be the first time in, since 89 that I haven't been carrying both roles. And it'll give me a chance to spend more time in the communities to get that real good feeling done. Much like Janet's people when they go out to the villages and Alakakit and Hoosley and Hughes for spring carnival. It's, we want to make sure that this state, it is our state sport, doesn't matter if it's speed mushing or distance, we want to make sure that everybody's really excited about what we do. Good quality field, Dallas Sevia is bad, of course. Pete just showed his, um, how well he can do in races, and uh, Ryan Reddington, our champ, is back again. And we're, there's probably 10 people right now that I can't tell you who's gonna win this race. Mm, well, that's exciting. Yeah, it is. What do you think the future looks like for, uh, you know, you mentioned climate change, mm -hmm. and we know that there are people who don't like that long distance race because Absolutely. they think it's cruel to dogs. What do you think the future looks like this year? You mentioned 96 signed up a few years ago, only 43 this year. How is it looking? Well, I think, I think, I think it's, the last couple of years I was a little bit concerned, but all the qualifying races, the Copper Basin, the Connect 200, um, you know, the Yukon Quest, both the Canadian Quest and the Alaskan Quest that they're doing out of Fairbanks and Whitehorse, uh, it used to be if I didn't know who they were and I made a couple phone calls and I called my friend Tim White in Minnesota, they didn't exist. There's a lot of people getting into the sport of mushing. You don't have to run the Iditarod. You don't have to go to the World Championship in Anchorage. I think people are really enjoying getting out. You know, we're also, myself included, connected to our phones and we're seeing a lot of the junior races, the junior Iditarod, the junior Willow race. You know, Emily Robinson, who of course uh, won the Kinnick 200 and she's looking for four-time champ at the junior race. There is a real upswell of maybe not the bigger kennels we used to see, but somebody that wants to have 10, 12 dogs and make it a family edition. So it's, uh, I'm really happy. Yes, we have people that still don't like what we do, but I think you're going to find that in anything you get into. My main thing is that do you believe in what we do as far as in the sled dog sports, and I know Janet does, um, then go forward. Well, Janet, let's turn to you. Your uh, Mark may not be a race marshal this year, but he certainly has been for many years. You're also a race marshal. Describe the duties and, and how they differ in this more urban setting, especially when you're running during for rendezvous. Right. <clears throat> that is so true. And I, I you know, Mark, I, I'm hopeful for you that you are able to re to bring on that position for race marshal, but I'm not holding my breath. I, it's hard to replace not Mark Norman in that position, but our roles are a bit different. There's no doubt about it, but that logistics of a race and the aspect of pulling together the entire thing, not only making sure the trails are in place, not making sure that volunteers are in place, et cetera. Mark, you know, commands a small army throughout the state of Alaska in the Iditarod, but relatively speaking, we have huge numbers of people out on the trail because of something that is unique to us and that is our entire trail system is in the middle of anchorage our entire system winds around a, a very urban city uh, there's no doubt about it that i don't know of another place where you know seven miles of of trail going out is streets and bike trail that is usually filled with either vehicles or other multi-use trail uh, users. 
And then even as we're on our own Alaskan Sled Dog and Racing Association trails, those are intersected by hundreds, and I do mean hundreds of trails by other users, skiers and bikers and joggers and dog walkers. And this is a different kind of pressure than what Mark Fort faces with his Iditarod teams who have different kinds of, of uh, challenges along their trail. Ours is about the pressure of doing our race in the city. It's also the most exciting thing about our race. And we are so unique in this, and it's one that makes the uh, Open World Championship, I think, one of the most prestigious races in the world. There, if, if you have a dog team that can run at that speed and also navigate running down streets between cars and people, as well as all of the steeplechase nature of our culverts and, and overpasses and the like, that is a remarkable dog. It's a, it's a dog that is like no other, right? And I feel like this is something that's very exciting about the Open World Championship. It's entirely in the city. And though the name of Iditarod and um, Yukon Quest and some of the mid-distance races are very top in the minds of people, in reality, I think more people have actually been on the side of the Open World Championship sled dog race to see dogs running um, than, than they might ever hope to see them running through a long distance race. And that makes Anchorage very special. I feel like we have the Olympics of sled dog sports right in our city. Um, but, <laughs> I love that. That's but, great. <laughs> yeah, I will say this about it is that I, um, I know Mark just said that for a little bit he was concerned with some, some of the dropping, um, you know, a, a participation levels. And I still don't understand how many, how there are that many teams that will put themselves out on the Iditarod. In my mind, when I look at the Open World Championship, there are only so many dogs in the world that can do that. And similarly, there are only so many dogs that can be competitive in the Iditarod. There is enough support in the Iditarod that those people who want the experience of such a long distance race can take part in it. I don't think that's true in the open world championship. If you are not at that elite level, at that professional level of open class racing, you're not gonna actually make it around. And I, I think it's almost the equivalent of saying, of a person saying, wow, I love watching, um, watching uh, Olympic ski jumping. So I think I'll sign up for that. You just, you're not going to make it off the jump uh, without, without serious um, injury. And so same thing in terms of the open world championship in the middle of Anchorage. Those are the top teams in the world. And they have something that no one else across the sport of sled dog racing have. They have those most elite athletes that you can find. And mm -hmm. there's just only so many that can do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So participation levels is not something I look at. I do look at that recruitment like Mark was talking about. Sure. And I'm so excited by the amount of juniors who are participating, families who are doing that kind of uh, work at the, at the youngest levels with, with uh, you know, rising stars. And I'm also looking at the very, very um, dramatic increase in use of sled dogs in terms of other sled dog sports, maybe in ski joring, maybe in open, I mean, in uh, limited class racing. In other words, I see it as being kind of an every person sport at this time. And Mark is right. You don't have to go to the open world championship or the Iditarod to fully enjoy sled dog racing. And I think that's the positive aspect of what I'm seeing right now. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you. It's wonderful to hear the enthusiasm from both of you. That yeah. sounds like the future looks pretty bright. How can people who really do uh, want to see the sport succeed and continue and flourish, what can the average person do to help, Mark? Is there anything they can do? Um, be a part of it. Come volunteer for the rendezvous. I, I'm listening to Janet nodding my head through the whole time. I wouldn't trade places with you, Janet, for anything. Um, I'm always honored when I get to come down on 4th Avenue and watch the race. I've been doing it for watching for 30 years. It is, and remember, that's where all our dogs came from. You know, via the Yukon River, of course, we have Europeans coming over, maybe more so when uh, they're coming over now for the Rondi. But how can they get involved? You can always offer to help on the weekends. You can, there's children's races that go on. I know they have a really good program within ASDRA down here, the club here that works with the same in Fairbanks, of course, you're statewide. So 
And all these villages, I brought up these spring carnivals. People can just get involved. Yes, every musher is always looking for a little help with a tank of gas or sponsorship, but just being a part of it. Go to the opening ceremonies, go to the banquet, just try to learn more about it and you'll get hooked like we have. Well, thank you so much, uh, Janet and Mark, for being here this evening with me. It's been great to have you on, and I appreciate the enthusiasm. I know how much I love to, although I've only been at the ceremonial start, <laughs> I have to admit, but uh, it's always so much fun to be at the start of the race and be on the trails around the city in this uh, amazing, iconic race and all of the other ones that take place. Thank you both so much. There's a lot of love for dogs in Alaska, and sled dog racing is part of a centuries-long tradition of traveling across the Alaskan wilderness behind a team eager to please their driver. The future will be challenged by climate change and public sentiment, but for the mushers, the training runs and races are all part of a lifestyle that centers around a love of Alaska winter and Alaska sled dogs. That's it for this edition of Alaska Insight. Visit our website, alaskapublic.org, for breaking news and reports from our partner stations across the state. While you're there, sign up for our free daily digest so you won't miss any of Alaska's top stories of the day. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Lori Townsend. Good night.